Thanks, Tom. I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with you today. And happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Hope you all had a nice holiday. Today I wanted to first let you know there is no financial tie to disclose and speak to you briefly about comorbidity and cancer, uh, describing how comorbidity affects older patients with cancer and older patients who are eligible for cancer screening. Then I'll discuss overuse and cancer care. And finally, speak a little bit about our, our copper center and let you know the status of that. So before we continue, overuse. What is overuse? What is excessive when we're thinking about cancer screening or cancer care? Is this something that's purely in the eye of the beholder, in that people's values, people's expectations differ from patient to patient? Or is there a particular line that we should not cross? Maybe we shouldn't be screening everyone over the age of 95 for colorectal cancer. If you buy into that, then maybe we shouldn't be screening everyone over the age of 90, 85, 80, 75 years. At some point, we'll start to become uncomfortable with these questions and decisions and wondering whether we can have these broad criteria that are based on age or some other cl clinical factors regarding who should and who shouldn't be treated. This whole issue, for me, is analogous to a very famous Supreme Court case of about 50 years ago, where the justices were asked to weigh in on the difference between pornography and art. Chief Justice Potter Stevens famously weighed in by saying, you know, I, I know art, I, I, I've seen hardcore pornography, it's hard to define it, pornography, but I know it when I see it. And I think as clinicians, and also for some policy makers, overuse in cancer care is the same uh, type of an issue. It's hard to define, but we know it when we see it. And the problem is, that's not good enough. We really need to take our level of uh, scientific rigor and clinical expectations and clinical counseling for patients to the next level. So we're not just saying, uh, you know, I know overuse when I see it, but how can we better, to, how can we better apply evidence to individual patients to allow them to make decisions about which, which management options may not be helpful for them. So as a first step in helping patients to make informed decisions, we need to wade into the jungle of evidence, of evidence-based medicine. You know how many publications there are now in PubMed? Over 19 million. A new paper is published into PubMed every minute of every day. So it's really complicated to try to identify articles or evidence that might be applicable to a particular patient. And however, it's even more difficult when we're thinking about the older patient or the older cancer patient. For those patients, the body of evidence doesn't really look like this. It looks more like this. There's very little evidence to guide our decision making about older patients with cancer. And as an example, if you think about cooperative group uh, enrollment into cancer trials, Roughly 70% of kids with cancer actually at some point in their, in their care trajectory are enro enrolled in a cooperative trial. This compares, uh, we, we did an analysis a few years back, this compares to only about 3% of adults aged age 30 to 64 who are enrolled in trials. And it, the enrollment fraction decreases with increasing age. So if you look at people over the age of 75, only about a half a percent of these patients are being enrolled in cooperative group trials. So of course we don't know how to treat these patients because we're not studying them. So one of the main reasons why patients, older patients, are not being enrolled in studies is because of their chronic condition burden or comorbidity. And uh, I'll ask you to pardon me. I'll, I'll, I will uh, flip back and forth between comorbidity and chronic illness. It's, I work with a few cardiologists. For them, cancer is a comorbidity. For me, Heart disease is a comorbidity. So this is talk about chronic illness, but uh, bear with me. So what do we know about chronic conditions and cancer patients? As I've mentioned, we do know that they, in many times, preclude cancer trial enrollment, either explicitly, because it's something that's written into the eligibility criteria for a study, or implicitly, because uh, the clinicians uh, or the investigators are, are trying to steer patients away from the uh, new and perhaps riskier, riskier therapies. And that's really a shame because then if we think about where we are obtaining the evidence, it's similar to that old joke about looking where the light is, about the, the guy who is encountered uh, late at night out on the street uh, looking underneath a street lamp and someone approaches him and says, what, what are you doing? Looking for my keys. Where'd you drop them? Well, actually over on the hill, but I'm just looking here because that's where the light is. 
And when we're thinking of our, our, our chronic illness laden elderly population, uh, I fear that with clinical research, we're often doing the same thing. We're looking, looking where the light is. What else do we know about chronic conditions? They have a, a strong effect on patient outcomes. Uh, for instance, among patients with stage one through three colon cancer, uh, here, let me orient you if I can do this. Um, we estimated the population attributable risk. These are among patients with a diagnosis of cancer. What percent of deaths in that population are attributable to specific chronic illnesses? So about 9% of deaths in this sample were attrib attributable to heart failure, 5%, 4% to COPD, diabetes, et cetera. So, and this has dramatic imp implications if you think about how we consider cancer mortality rates or the cancer burden in society. A lot of cancer, quote unquote, cancer patients are actually dying of other things, not necessarily from their cancer. So that's what we know about cancer. What do we, I uh, should say, about comorbidity? What are we starting to figure out? Well, well chronic conditions, uh, they can exert an influence on patient outcomes through a variety of modalities, uh, such as uh, through affecting general underlying metabolic derangements and physiology, such as the work Melinda's doing looking at insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia and the impact of exercise and cancer prognosis. There's a, a very profound feedback loop there. Chronic conditions can also affect cancer care through a variety of mechanisms. First of all, they could actually just change, this is the simple, most simple way, they could change your probability of receiving cancer therapy. Then we looked at adjuvant therapy for patients with stage <coughs> three colon cancer, and we looked at three different chronic illnesses, and the y-axis is the proportion of these stage three patients uh, that were obtained from a, a SEER Medicare linked database who had received adjuvant therapy. And as you would expect, patients with heart failure were substantially less likely to receive adjuvant therapy than patients without heart failure. Uh, diabetes and COPD had less of a strong, strong link to, to receive a therapy. The next question is, is this a good thing or not? Maybe these people shouldn't be getting, I should say these people shouldn't be getting adjuvant therapy. So this gets at the issue of chronic conditions and whether they moderate the effectiveness of cancer therapy. If patients who have a condition are less likely to benefit from anti-cancer treatment than patients without a condition. So we used our, our same data, uh, a database, looking at patients with stage three colon cancer. Uh, we basically threw everything we could into our model to try to uh, account for differences between patients who received adjuvant chemo versus those who didn't. And the real question was to look at the benefit of chemotherapy as a function of chronic disease status, using propensity scores, which is just a really a not that fancy way of uh, adjusting for all, all other patient and clinical factors. Uh, we use, again, the SEER Medicare Link Database, which is a, SEER are, is a national consortium of cancer registries. These are linked at the patient level to Medicare data. So the database provides robust information about cancer characteristics links to their administrative claims. So what we found was this. If you look at patients with, uh, let me orient so this, these are the hazard ratio associated with receipt of adjuvant therapy. Patients who are, so if you're on the left side of one, that means you had a decreased mortality uh, for patients who received adjuvant chemo. So for pe people who did not have heart failure, uh, the parameter estimate was about 0.7, 30% reduction in mortality. People with heart failure, actually the parameter estimate was similar, also about a 30% reduction in mortality. This is the same for each of the other, uh, each of the other conditions that we looked at. So two points I want to drive home before we leave this slide. Number one, this estimate of a 30% reduction uh, in mortality that we obtained in this observational study was the same as the reduction in mortality seen in the original randomized trials of adjuvant chemo. So well done observational studies can uh, reinforce uh, and emulate the findings from, from randomized trials. Secondly, it appears that uh, this chronic condition burden may not necessarily decrease the benefit of adjuvant chemotherapy. So that's a key question, is whether or not we were able to adequately adjust for underlying patient factors, such as health status, 
uh, and, uh, and the severity of the comorbidity. And that's a key question as far as how we need to, how we need to move ahead. Um, so similarly, we looked at this issue with, uh, with rate, and this is actually a perfect segue, looking at radiation therapy uh, for older women with breast cancer. Uh, for many years, this has been the standard of care following breast-conserving surgery. Uh, and it uh, had been unclear whether older women benefit. So the C C9343 trial suggested uh, among women over the age of 70, there was a very small benefit obtained with, with, with adjuvant radiation therapy. Uh, and again, the effectiveness in routine practice was unclear. So we used, uh, again, our SEER Medicare database uh, to to uh, analyze this question. And what we found was basically, if you look here, so after five years, uh, the percent of women who had had a, uh, uh, evidence of a recurrence was about 1% in the radiation group, about 5% uh, in the non-radiation group. Absolute treatment benefit was about 4%. This is almost exactly what they uh, demonstrated in the randomized trial. Again, reinforcing that observational studies can provide very useful useful information. But we took it a step further, because the question is, if we're thinking about comorbidity and chronic illness burden, we need, need to really carefully think about life expectancy. And the question is whether these women are going to live long enough, will they even live for five years, to experience the benefit of radiation? So when we took into account the life expectancy and estimated the number of women who would need to receive radiation treatment in order to prevent one recurrence, what we found was there was a dramatic change in the upper age range. So in, among women who are 85 and up, uh, the, if you look at the chronic illness burden here, that's zero condition, one condition, two or more concomitant conditions, the number needed to treat increases from about, where it was about 20 women, increases to 50 to over 100 women. Again, it's reinforcing that comorbidity and life expectancy can have a strong effect on, on treatment effectiveness. The take home points so far, uh, that well-designed observational studies can yield results that are eerily similar to those of randomized trials. Uh, comorbidity strongly predicts patient outcomes. And comorbidity is an effect modifier, even when acting independently of ac actual cancer treatment effect. What I mean by that is traditionally when we think about comorbidity in, in, in cancer therapy and cancer potential complications of therapy, we think of a direct interaction in the sense of somehow that having a comorbid condition makes you more likely to suffer a, an adverse or a adverse event or a, a toxic uh, a toxicity. However, even if it doesn't directly interact with the therapy, comorbidity and age by virtue of their impact of, on life expectancy and your time at which you are potentially uh, eligible or alive uh, uh, and prone to a relapse, um, comorbidity can also dramatically decrease the benefits of adjuvant therapy or of screening. So to put, to put this differently, when we think about comparative effectiveness research in cancer, we need to incorporate multiple factors. And this is just a very simple schematic. Uh, we, we should consider both life expectancy and the risk of cancer recurrence. And patients with a low risk of recurrence and a short life expectancy would be expected to have very little benefit from, from receiving a therapy. Uh, and conversely, patients who have a high risk cancer, or if you want to think about this in terms of screening, high risk of developing cancer, and a long life expectancy would have a, a much greater benefit. So thinking about this group, the low benefit group, at some point, certain patients within this group transition from having low benefit to really no benefit. And that, that's the challenge is to identify uh, which patients are in this group, and then how do we act? How do we act upon this information? Do we just say no? To, should, we, should we decline uh, treating these patients? Um, that is something that actually I'm not going to address in this talk. Uh, uh, declining care is a, 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 a socially, politically, uh, morally a fascinating uh, uh, conversation. But what I want to focus on is really the issue of, of how we can clinically inform our inform our decisions. And, uh, I'll share with you a few studies where we looked at the overuse, a potential uh, overuse or un use without uh, appropriate uh, outcomes uh, for cancer care. So the first, first, first question would be, uh, let's think about uh, screening. So the major screening trials, there aren't a lot of cancer sites that have had large randomized trials to support their use, but we do have them for fecal occult blood screening, right? Uh, 
uh, for colorectal cancer. We have them for mammography. Both of those set, uh, types of trials, the randomized trials in both domains, uh, have both found that it takes five years in order to find a difference between the screened and the unscreened groups in terms of mortality. Why is that? Because screening doesn't help you by finding the late stage cancer. Screening helps patients to live longer by finding the early stage resectable tumors, or uh, in the case of uh, colorectal cancer, by even removing polyps before they develop into a cancer. So it takes five years before you see a benefit from screening. Therefore, applying that concept to this, uh, this model here, uh, if, you, if you have a life expectancy of less than five years, you're, you're not going to see a benefit from screening, regardless of your cancer risk. So we looked at uh, Medicare data, where we uh, divided patients uh, according to age and comorbidity burden and estimated their life expectancy. And focus here on the 75 to 85 year old group. Uh, this is an important age group because the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force was recently called the task, task force called the task, for uh, um, <coughs> changing the recommendations for colorectal cancer screening over the age of 75. And specifically what they said is we should stop uh, routinely offering screening in this group. So we were curious about, if you look within this group at different life expectancy strata, were clinicians providing or obtaining uh, screening colonoscopy that at different rates? And what we, we did find here, this is the um, <coughs> screening colonoscopy rate among the patients with the longest life expectancy. These are the people with the, sh the shortest, the greatest comorbidity burden. And what we found is that there is actually a nice gradient. So clin clinicians are obtaining these screening tests less often when patients uh, have a higher burden of comorbidity. However, it's important to note that this group, so the 75 to 85 year uh, old Medicare beneficiaries represents about 13 million people. This group, the short life expectancy, the real sickies, this represents about a million people. So if you, if you just do the math, if you look at the screening colonoscopy use, it, in this million Medicare beneficiaries, there's still, uh, uh, translates to thousands of screening colonoscopies that are being done every year uh, on patients with very little chance of benefit. So uh, carrying this theme to treatment, we did a similar analysis. So we looked at prostate cancer. Uh, according to NCCN guidelines, we looked at the um, cancer risk, uh, meaning the risk of um, recurrence or progression according to their uh, tumor stage and grade. And then we also looked at the life expectancy. Uh, based on age and comorbidity. So as you can see, the people, the guys with the shortest life expectancy did have the lowest probability of treatment. As you had a longer life expectancy, uh, the probability of curative therapy did increase. But an interesting thing that we found was that when we looked at temporal trends in use of curative therapy, check this out, we found the guys with the shortest life expectancy, the less than five year, who, according to the NCCN, would have no chance of benefit, there was a dramatic increase in use over the past 10 years. Whereas in, in these other groups where there's a possible benefit, less, uh, less of an increase in use. Uh, now, uh, same, same issue as far as imaging. Uh, here, uh, the NCCN guidelines recommend uh, that men with low risk <coughs> prostate cancer at the time of their initial evaluation should not receive diagnostic imaging because it has a very low probability of, of altering management. So we looked, and, and conversely, uh, these guys here, the high-risk tumors are supposed to be imaged. What we found when we looked at the receipt of imaging in the peri-diagnostic period was that among the low-risk men who are not supposed to receive imaging, about 45% had. Uh, conversely, 65% of the men with high-risk disease had undergone imaging. So yeah, there is a, there's a difference, you know, that's great. But none of these guys were, were uh, as per NCCN, uh, supposed to receive Im imaging. So we are, there's strong evidence of over-imaging uh, men with incident prostate cancer. I'm actually going to skip over one thing. Um, so take, uh, take home point, sorry, Pam. <laughs> uh, many Medicare patients are not res uh, uh, receiving benefit screening, I should say. Many Medicare patients are receiving a screening and treatments that may not be benefiting them. So I uh, just wanted to speak for a couple of minutes here. 
uh, just to update uh, the group about our Copper Center. Um, speaking of Thanksgiving, we're very pleased to have uh, received uh, support from the Cancer Center uh, for our work. So the Copper Center is a, a group of investigators um, that is uh, <coughs> diverse. <laughs> we, we come from a variety of, uh, of specialties and backgrounds and interests. And uh, we have three goals. So first is the goal of Copper Center. Um, uh, is to, number one, generate new knowledge that will improve the care and outcomes of patients with cancer. COPPER stands for Cancer Outcomes Policy and Effectiveness Research. Um, our, second, our second goal is to uh, develop and refine new research methods and data sources that can help us to generate new data. And third, uh, uh, our third objective is to uh, engage and train new clinicians and researchers in uh, outcomes and policy <coughs> and effectiveness research. So where do we go from here? Uh, one of the main things that we're focusing on uh, is, is really trying to move us to the next, to the next level. Uh, this is an incredibly crude way of thinking about patients with cancer. As we're developing new ways of genetic profiling, of identifying tumor markers that are associated with response to therapy and risk of recurrence, as we're developing more refined ways of understanding patient health status and life expectancy, we can really present patients with far more refined um, information to help them to make decisions. So as a, uh, an example, this is a screenshot from Adjuvant Online. I think many of you may, may have seen this before. This is an online tool that was quite popular uh, among clinicians. It started in the world of breast cancer. And uh, people just plugged it, it was so simple. People plugged in just a little bit of information, like the overall health status, uh, breast cancer, number of nodes, tumor receptor positive or negative. They would spit out this, uh, th this information for you. Here is your um, probability of being alive uh, uh, in, in 10 years if you had no additional therapy. Then they give you the incremental benefit of, of different therapeutic options. This took off like wildfire. For a while, this was really, uh, Really, really popular. <coughs> but I would argue that while this was helpful for its time, if you want to think about a video game analogy, uh, this was like Pong, the, 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 first, the first ever uh, widely used video game. And the place where, where we need to be and where we can be is, is this is a screenshot of, of, of now of, of, of we, uh, of something that is a little more technologically advanced. And we can, we can and should be providing our patients with much more refined uh, and evolve information so they can make decisions about not just which, uh, what randomized trials uh, say about uh, the average patient in the average population, but so patients can say to their physician, well, what about me? What about patients like me when I get treated? Will I benefit or will I not? Thank you.